site map in Petersburg, which I'm going to demonstrate, demonstrates the relationship between a modern city and hypertext. It exists in tandem with the print book Petersburg, Petersburg, Novel and City, both of which are the product of my work with a group of graduate students in uh, Russian history and Russian literature at Berkeley. The initial impetus to the website was Andre Gilly's novel, uh, Petersburg, 1916, a modernist city text whose plot is motorized by the assassination of a high government official and bomb explosion. Modernism, its narrative and representational practices already contain the seeds of hypertextuality. Hypertext, based on thinking fragmentally, is the hallmark of modernist aesthetics and modernity, whose latest iteration is, of course, the web. Rather than holes and thick structures, modernism gives preference to red contingencies <coughs> and montage of fragments. This is precisely what our website's intersecting itineraries through early 20th, Peter, through early 20th century Petersburg demonstrate. An exploratory medium, hypertext and its extension hypermedia resemble the way we explore cities. The web experience may also be compared to the sensory psychic shock associated with the modern city which Bailey's Petersburg aligns with the quote-unquote swarming metropolis, his term, during the 1905 revolution. The linkage of urban space and the way it was experienced at the beginning of the 20th century was famously articulated by Zimmel as rapid telescoping of changing images, pronounced differences within what is grasped at a single glance, and the unexpectedness of violent stimuli. Concerned with the nervous system and emotions of city dwellers, Simo defines urban modernity as the experiencing and interpretation of the world in terms of our inner life, and indeed as an inner world, the dissolution of fixed contents in the fluid elements of the soul whose forms are merely forms of motion. In other words, he links the experience of the city with affect and constant flux. Simmel's version, vision, excuse me, is remarkably similar to the urban phantasmagoria of Bailey's novel, in which motion and emotion inform narrative and the visceral contact between city and brain. The web has been described as a map-based medium. The original 17th century genre of city views represented from above was directly linked to cartography. Maps picture geographic space from above, imposing spatial order on unruly space. Their vantage point represents a position of surveillance and control that may be aligned with Foucault's panoptic vision. In the prologue of Petersburg, the narrator proclaims that the capital of Russia appears on maps in the form of two small circles, one set inside the other with a black dot in the center. He describes the novel as surging from a dot on the map as if to assert the affiliation of writing, mapping, and surveillance, or panoptic vision. In practice of everyday life, Michel de Certeau's privilege, privileges uh, the performative space of city texts, not panoptic vision, because they are participatory and mobile. He writes that the cities can be seen, or that cities can be seen from a readable panoramic view and random, unreadable street level. The eye level mobile view of the city, however, figures readability as well. The pedestrian's reading experience of street and shop signs and so on. It offers what Benjamin calls a camera close-up in which space expands and makes visible or readable what is invisible from above or from a distance. Instead of Foucault's detached theoretical gaze that disciplines space or Certeau's static perspective from above, the pedestrian experiences a journey of reading urban detail. Lefebvre viewed urban space in similar terms, homogenous and disciplinary abstract space 
versus uncontrollable everyday social space characterized by diversity and ever-changing configurations to which he gives preference as well. The relationship of city panorama offering what Surtout calls the pleasure of seeing the whole, an eye-level view, was considered by Ivan Gretz, a medievalist and professor of St. Petersburg University at the beginning of the 20th century. According to his student on Cicero, Gretz developed an excursionist approach to the study of cities that he called living organisms which were to be anatomized. He, uh, he taught that city conquest, quote unquote conquest, must begin from an elevated spot. Following his mentor, Ansifuna, writes in the soul of Petersburg that its discovery should begin at quote unquote bird's eye level, namely the cupola of St. Isaac's, and only after that at eye level. The view also represents the scrutiny of a, differ, of a difficult modernist text, like Billy's, that uh, the reader is challenged to make legible. Billy's panoptic city and its surveilled inhabitants are seen from dizzying shifts in visual vantage points, producing a plurality of perspectives that the reader is called upon to read and experience. These per perspectives contribute to the spatialization of Petersburg's narrative. As Joseph Frank would claim in 1945, modernist writing spatialized narrative at the expense of temporal progression under the influence of the spatial arts. Deleuze and Guattari write that the city exists only as a function of circulation and of circuits which created and which it creates. It is defined by entries and exits. This could serve as a description of hypermedia. A modernist correlate was collage, consisting of a montage of images and texts, a decentered art form that is entered from different points. Mapping Petersburg with its multiple entry points offers something similar. But instead of well-known city sites, it focuses, like Benjamin's <clears throat> Arcades project, on the marginal. Everyday life and material culture, literary and political life, but as located in urban space. The web creates networks or grids like those that define cities, for instance, the network of tram lines in the age of modernity, to overcome distance. As Sertot tells us, vehicles of mass transportation in Athens that traverse, organize, and link places and create itineraries are called metaphorae. The metaphoric web analogy is obvious. Our website is a matrix of Petersburg's distances and contiguities organized as itineraries telling a variety of stories about the mutable historical city for instance, the relationship between fixed structures, architecture, and events, large and small. Narratives can be divided into those that have definitive endings and those that don't. The former provide the anticipated pleasure of closure and imposition of order, possible on the web, even though the pleasure of the web is its open-endedness. <coughs> And in this regard, it again resembles the city. Moreover, despite the striving of cities for order, they remain uncontrollable and ever-changing. Billy's orderly, quote-unquote, rectilineal Petersburg, in which the unruly human swarm separated from the center by drawbridges, literally oozes into it and redefines it in the 1905 revolution. The real pleasure of hypermedia narrative, however, is the unexpected and contingent, which Baudelaire and Ed Benjamin associated with the figure of the flaneur. The web experience resembles the random street scenes, signboards, anonymous pedestrians, and other distractions that define flannerie, or returning to the tram metaphor that the passenger sees through the tram window. These images may serve as a distraction, the passenger gets off, 
the tram to see it close up and unexpectedly enters a different narrative from the one he initially envisioned. Benjamin calls such exploration strain, losing oneself in the city, which he associates with the collection of insignificant objects and events and endows them with the aura of significance. The impetus to the website, as I said, was Billy's novel whose characters navigate the city along mostly real urban routes. Similarly, the itinerary visions of, vision of Karen, you see the itineraries yeah, above you, um, or rather above me, maybe above me too, I don't know. From above and from below, the city eye level, etc. That was just a silly joke. Um, so the, the itinerary visions of terror about the assassination of the interior minister Plebe on which the novel was partially based maps the assassins and Plebe's roots through the city, typifying what Lefebvre would have described as the everyday meeting place of the city dweller and history. The website's hero is Alexander Bloch. Petersburg celebrated poet Flaneur, who famously explored the city, especially its margins, and literally made it, or them, the margins, readable. You can visit his puppet show and apartments of those associated with the play on the Enchanted Masquerade. Stroll with him along the Karpovka River on the city margins. Attend his <coughs> funeral. Witness the last serendipitous meeting of Bloch and Zinglai the Gipus on a tram. Meet him on Troitsky Bridge, or at Vyacheslav Ivanov's and Lydia Zinoviva and Yuval's Tower in public locales. In other words, this website spatializes block. It can also be navigated through Petersburg's material culture and everyday life. For example, on Yevsky Prospect, you can visit a bank, colonial stores, a confectionery, House of Singer, which is a modern office building, woman's drugstore, which was still is, it's still there, right? It has been renamed again, it used to be, it was called House of Singer originally, then it became Dom Knigi, it still is Dom Knigi in some sense, but the label is Dom Zingera. Uh, so, uh, you can go to a movie theater and so on. You can go to the city slaughterhouse, you can go, you can cross bridges, or you can go to Adachodny Dom, in which the famed tower was located and explored the Ivanov apartment. On one of the tram lines, we cross Trinity Bridge, whose story is described on the French in Petersburg, the story of its building. Or we can pursue narratives of death and dying, um, the funeral of love. But Billy's novel represents Petersburg as a dying city, as does the Petersburg text or pursue narratives defined by urban modernity, the tram line, sewing machine on singer sewing machine, or bomb explosion on vision of visions of terror. And um, I still intend to create an itinerary on Billy's Petersburg that will visually represent a narrative defined by bomb explosion, although we like to use the word creativeness. It will require a lot of creativeness on my part how to do or we can follow the slaughtered cow to the destinations where its parts end up from the slaughterhouse and on anatomizing modernity and so on. So let me move to the website and show you some things, uh, like to demonstrate some things I was talking about. And let's start on, uh, let me start on Yevsky Prospect, the main street. As you see, um, this the decor of the frame is Art Nouveau, <coughs> modern, and I took this from Stelice Um So let's enter the site and let's go to Gibraltar, <coughs> to Hotel Gibraltar, where Block. No, sorry. No, I'm not doing well today. Sorry about that. This is it. All right. See, those were uh, those others that I uh, turned on were other locations I guess. Okay. 
the Paris Hotel Europa in Budapest, where uh, Bloch went to the Root Garden restaurant, saw the city from above, um, and described it. There's a long description that he offers of uh, the city he sees in love. Uh, continuing looking at the city from above, although, of course, Petersburg is a flat city, so there aren't re any real elevated spots you know, from where you can see the city from above. So we've moved uh, to the Ivanov Tower, and uh, as you see, it says from the kitchen to the roof. And at the Ivanov Tower, um, poets would gather uh, and read their poetry at the, uh, at, on the roof. Here we see Mikhail Kuzmin, this is a rare photograph of Kuzmin, uh, sitting at the tower or sitting at the rooftop, or on the rooftop, and Bloch uh, is known to have recited his best known poem, Yisna on this, uh, on this rooftop. But we, what we can do here is we can go to the Ivanov apartment, and you see we have a map of the Ivanov apartment, and some of these rooms are clickable, but let me just go to one, which is the living room where the uh, Wednesdays of the tower would take place. This was the tower salon. Uh, and here we have a caricature by Sergei Gorodetsky, who is sitting in front uh, of the habitués of the tower, and they're all well known. This is Brusov, this is Salagub, Remizov, Ivanov himself. Here is Bloch with wings. Next to him is Kuzmin with wings. And here is Andre Bieli himself, somehow uh, in the background rather than the foreground, and one more. So uh, let's return to the rooftop, because from there we can move on to here. And from here we can go to the Kakuku River. Um, This is an itinerary, the Karpatka itinerary, where, and this is uh, a portrait of Bloch by Somov, and we can go and learn more about Somov, but the, the painter, but let's, let's go down to the And here you can visit several locales along the river that Bloch passed by. For example, the house of the famous actress Maria Sadina that he, he knew and which was on, um, on his strolls. Okay, I'm going to go back. So, where do I want to go? I want to go to Lenore par excellence, which takes us to the Enchanted Masquerade, an itinerary called the Enchanted Masquerade, uh, which, which has to do with the famous play, The Puppet Show. But uh, here we are at the apartment of Natalia Volokhova, uh, Bloch's great love whom he met during the making of the puppet show. She played the main role. And um, here, she walked, uh, he walked the city with her. You have, you have these lines here. In general, as you see, this website is almost like a book. There's a great deal of text. Yeah? Um, and, he, they would walk the city at night and amongst other places that they would walk across was Trinity Bridge, and here we come to Trinity Bridge on the French of Petersburg, where we can, uh, where we can learn the history of the building of the bridge. It was built by a French company, but um, let's instead stray to 
tramvai or a tram itinerary. And here we see a tram crossing uh, Trinity Bridge. Uh, the, and it was shortly before the revolution. It became one of the stops on the blue line, or what we have called, or what Alison Tuff uh, designed this, uh, this itinerary called. I don't think it was called the blue line originally. But let's go to the previous stop on the blue line. And here is the meeting of Bloch, the serendipitous meeting of Bloch and Zinaida de Gipius. Zinaida de Gipius was a well-known poet of this period. Um, they met on the tram and at the corner of Sadovoya and Yevsky Prospect. And um, Bloch had just published one of his very well-known poems, his, most, his best known poem, a long poem called the Twelve, as you see here, here is a, uh, an illustration by Anyanka. And um, Gipius, as others, interpreted it as a uh, poem that celebrates the Bolshevik Revolution. And she tells him on the tram that jamais, never again, we, publicly, we are no longer friends. In her memoir, she writes about this several years later. She emigrates and she writes about this meeting, which she describes as our last meeting on Earth. And um, here we are at the funeral. And we can, we, can, um, we can navigate this itinerary in two ways. Uh, there is the route, which is the route of the funeral cortege yeah, from his apartment to Smolensk Cemetery. And let's look at an image here. This is, here you see uh, an original photograph of, uh, of the coffin being taken in to the Resurrection Church, and you can look at these different images, which, which we won't do. This is his grave, uh, his grave site, but let me go back. And let's take the second path, which has to do with narratives of death, or the narrative of death. And let's go to the first page, death of narrative. Uh, and here at the bottom, we you, you see we have several options, uh, and we we can follow one of these uh, Paris bomb as the source of modernity's narrative, or the slaughterhouse, or the singer factory. My favorite is the singer factory, just because I perhaps <laughs> no, this is not where I want to go. Because I did the singer sign, that's why it's my favorite. So uh, the, this is that's the house of singer. But let's go to the singer sign machine site. And again, we have very much an art nouveau decor. I took this from Stalitsky Saitsba, and uh, there are four. We can navigate it in four different ways. Here is the seeps for the narrative. Yeah, the same stress produces narrative, right? Uh, so to speak, she's the agent of narrative, and uh, the language of narrative. You know, there are some very obvious terms that from the from sewing that are uh, used in uh, that are used as narrative vocabulary, like the thread of narrative, or you know, there's Ariadne's thread, or there we can talk about a text and textile coming be etymologically being linked, etc. So let 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 me go. Let me go to. Let me go to singer advertisement. This is the logo, or rather the, the, uh, the singer trademark that <laughs> appeared in all singer stores. But 
Okay, we're going to move to another site. This has to do with the cow, right? From the train station where the cows arrive to uh, its different destinations. And, and one, one can follow this itinerary like all the others uh, in a linear fashion, but we can also, you know, look at the cow and the different parts. And for instance, Dimatagian, the first woman's pharmacy, Anyevsky Prospect. Dimatagian was made from bull's blood. Uh, let me go to photography for a second. I want, I want to end up in a uh, book. Let me go, because I want to show you, I realize I'm running out of time. Okay, I'll be very fast. I won't speak, I'll just move. You can see yourselves what's on the pages. Okay, here we are in the passage, and I want to go to the French in Petersburg, to the another image of the passage, and I'm trying to go very quickly. All right, here we are. Ditya Bolshova Goroda, a film by Yevgeny Bauer. This is uh, in Moscow. Um, how are they called? Targovi Dirkhi Dirkhi. So, children of the city. This is a silent film. Um, by the most important silent filmmaker, Russian silent filmmaker, Yevgeny Bauer. This should have sound. I mean, not the silent film, but there is musical accompaniment, but I, see, I don't hear it. But anyway, you see, you, you see uh, the, uh, the arcade in 1950. Yeah, and doesn't need additions and is 
we come to it. So, so the inspiration came from modernism, from that web project, because I never thought of working in these terms. This, that provided me with an alternative uh, under, for a, with an understanding of alternative narrative structures that can be used. Uh, and I um, tried them out on a seminar that I taught on Russian modernism, and people were interested in working on this. And there is a book that goes with this. I forgot to bring it. In fact, I have a copy of it with me which is a, a, a companion volume. Uh, and each one of the authors has an essay in it, a chapter in it, uh, representing you know, their, their topic, but in a different way. Yeah? Uh, and I think one of the interesting questions has to do with web narrative versus you know, print narrative. So we explore that to some extent in the uh, in the printed version. You know, what the difference is? Any more questions? How do you explain magic impact of travel on the consciousness of city dwellers, whereas, for example, Konka played absolutely no role in the well in the golden age of Russian literature. No, nobody. Right, of Kolka, whereas everybody is writing about tramway. So what's so special about tramway? Uh -huh. Well, modernity, I think, number mm -hmm. one, because it, the electric tram, you're talking about this, yeah. Um, it, is it its in it, 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 Pardon me? Is it, it it's based so uh, uh, imminent and uh, unstoppable being electric? Uh, so okay. what, what's the difference? Well, yeah. Well, the, how long did the Konka last? Yeah? It was an intermediate um, form of Until the 90s, 1890s. Uh, when did it start? When were the first tram? You're talking about the tram that is uh, pulled by a horse, right? Yes. That's what a Konka mm -hmm. is. I don't know when the Konka began. You know, Konka began in, in the mid 18th, 19th century and ended in the 1890s oh, really? with the, yeah, okay. with the coming of electric okay. power. So, but mm, Dostoevsky really? doesn't, does, does he mention no. Konka? No. no. So Konka has well, no, no bearing, no importance. Because points. Konka was public transportation, right? Yes. Yes, just as the tram was. I don't, uh, how much did, how much did the Konka cost? The tram was initially very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, well, it's, it's, it's one of the symbols of modernity in, in the city. I think that's why it assumed such significance. You're thinking of Gumilov's pond, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, well, Dr. Zhivaka died, died, died on the tram. Died on, on, the, on the tram, right. Uh, it's a good question. I, can't, I don't have a quick response mm -hmm. to it. Shklovsky writes about the tram and tram folklore. He, he collected tram folklore. I'm assuming it has something to do with, you know, modernity, electricity, the idea of speed, although it was, of course, very slow, I mean, but relative to, but I don't have, uh, I, I haven't thought about it. The tram is, anyway, not my topic. It's Alison Tubbs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wonder, uh, thank you very much for this fascinating experience. I wonder if you could refer us to um, another, uh, any other literary city web project um, used effectively, whether in education or otherwise. I'm aware at least of one, and that is uh, Walt Whitman's New York, and of course he was another uh, poet at <coughs> Canard, but, then, but that was done by a New Yorker. What I admire about your project is the way you juggle the two cultures and the two languages. I don't know if we have any parallel resource in Russian. I don't think you have anything like this in Russian. So my, in fact, if, I, if you want to hear my, uh, my dream, is that this gets translated into Russian. Yeah? Because I think, you know, I, I showed you that uh, only a little bit, yes? Because this is a huge site, and you can travel each itinerary in, multi, uh, in a linear fashion, which is useful. 
because, you know, you get from one place to the next in accordance with the narrative logic intended uh, by the author. Mm -hmm. But you can also juggle, yeah? Mm -hmm. And of course, we think about, I mean, I try to demonstrate that rather than a, line a linear progression. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, you know, this is, uh, you can travel this for five, six hours. There's a whole lot of material here. So I would love to have this translated into Russian. But I can't do that. This is up to somebody here to do the translation. Yeah, but have you heard of anything like uh, available like Balzac's Pari uh, Paris or well, Benjamin's Berlin or anything? Yes, there is Benjamin's Berlin, mm -hmm. and there is Hypermedia Berlin, which is a wonderful site mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, built at UCLA, heavily funded. Mine is on a shoestring, which I am proud of. Yeah, not sure. Because you know how it is when you apply for grants, it takes forever. And I was impatient. Some of you already know that I'm very impatient. <laughs> so I wanted to get this done. Uh, but I would uh, really uh, advise Hypermedia Berlin. It's, yeah, just type in Hypermedia Berlin, you will find that it, it has multiple layers of Berlin culture and history, yeah? uh, beautifully done. Uh, 